I'm Jasmine Moradi, and you're listening to the Queens of Tech podcast, a podcast series about raising the voice of workplace champions. 60 plus questions in around 30 minutes with women, non-binary and transgender influencers about their journey into STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. I started the Queens of Tech podcast initiative in May 2022 because I would like to retain more women, non-binary and transgenders in the tech industry. Talent is out there, but our work environment needs to improve for all to feel safer, stay authentic and to be valued for our contributions. My vision is to raise the workplace ecosystem for all in the tech industry by killing the imposter syndrome, stopping bad behavior and increasing equity opportunities. Each podcast talk is built around 60 plus questions regarding upbringing, education, career path, DEIB, and future advice. My mission is to bridge the gap between schools and workplaces by getting to the heart of my guest's personal life and career journey to inspire other girls, women, non-binary, and transgenders to unleash their full potential to reach top leadership roles in the tech industry. My goal is to raise the voice of tech champions around the world and together with companies, investors, and politicians, raise the challenges and opportunities around equity, inclusive diversity, and belonging in our workplaces. Enough is enough. I would like to enforce companies to build a sustainable, inclusive culture, to retain diverse talent, so we keep the workplace power equity to continue building future diverse and inclusive products. Your voice matters. In this episode, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Tech Queen Maral Vinyaza, co-founder of Mirado Consulting and working as a consultant as Chief Product Officer at Wear Labs. Hi, Maral. Hello. I'm very happy to have you joining us from Stockholm, Sweden, and also you're Iranian as me. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to join. It's such a pleasure. Now, let us dive into your journey into STEM. Hope you're ready for the Queens of Tech 60 plus questions. Yes, I'm ready. Let's warm up with a few fun facts about you. How would you describe your personality in three hashtags? Focused, practical, um, straight. How would you describe your life in three sentences? Kids, work, travel. What kind of music stimulates and motivates you the most? Depends a little bit on my mode, but usually I kind of like the old school music when I listened to when I was younger. It makes me happy. What's your personal motto? To keep it simple. I think a lot of time people overcomplicate things. What is your favorite book? Hard questions. There's so many books, but uh, one of the books that maybe inspire me the most is a book I read really long time ago, Cry the Beloved Country, which is about South Africa. And that kind of inspired me to uh, do my studies in South Africa. What is your favorite podcast? Actually, I don't listen to that many podcasts. Obviously, I listened to yours when I heard about it, but mostly I listen to audiobooks. Mac or PC? Mac. Say something interesting about you that most people don't know. In high school, I almost flunked in some subjects because I didn't want to do an oral presentation because I had a horrible stage fright. Um, so then one of my teachers actually forced me to do a rhetorical course and that kind of semi-cured me. What is your hidden talent? I started climbing and I was pretty good at it. So I will say climbing. If you were going to write a book about your life, what would the title be? I don't know. <laughs> Great start, Morale. Now, let us dig deeper. Our childhood has an effect on our adulthood. Our early experiences shape our belief about ourselves, others, and the world. Now, I want to discover your childhood. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Iran. I moved from Iran to Sweden when I was nine. And then we moved to a small city in Sweden called Nishapi. So I grew up there. And then when I was 17, moved to Stockholm with my family. What was your dream job as a child? I actually want to be a doctor when I was a kid. What was your favorite subject in school? I want to be a doctor. I really like biology, chemistry, and I like math. 
What was your least favorite subject? As I mentioned before, this rhetorical course was my least favorite. What is your earliest memory of technology and the arrival of the internet? I remember I take a HTML course in high school, which I found it very hard, so I didn't finish. And of course, remember dialing in to the internet and trying to surf on the internet and not being able to use the phone. That's probably it. Which were the three first technology gadgets you owned? I would say my first phone, I think it was in Nokia 3310. I had a Palm Pilot when I could download my schedule so I could see all my classes. Um, and I think I had this small iPod Nano when I had all my music on. Who was your female role model growing up and why? My mom, I think she's becoming more role model as I grew up and I actually understand what she's done. Um, and I think one of the major things that I appreciate more and more is I realized that growing up in Iran, I was in the Iran and Iraq war and my dad was a political. So we fled a lot during my childhood, but I don't remember any of these as a bad memory or something that kind of scarred me. I only remember happy times. So I think I owe this a lot to my mom to be able to shield us from every Everything that was around us and just give us happy memories. So for that, I think she's a great role model. Connected to that, how do you think where you grew up and the school you went to and the generation you come from influence your education and career choice? Maybe didn't influence the career choice, but to have a career definitely influenced. Coming from an immigrant family, it was very important to have education and show that you could do a career. So that definitely shaped for me to um, start the university and moving on and having a career. Very interesting. Now, I'm going to read two quotes. First one, how does the universe expect me to choose a career path at 16? I can't even choose what I want for dinner. Second, Abraham Lincoln said, I quote, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So Maral, I want to know the choices behind your career path. Where and what did you study at university? So I studied electrical engineering at KTH. Who and what influenced you to get into your choice of field? I wouldn't say anybody's influenced me, but as I mentioned before, I always liked medicine and I liked technology. I wanted to do something with that. And I knew that the electrical engineer path, you could choose your major and they had a medical engineering major you could choose from. So then I decided to take that path. What professional roles have you had before that led you to start your own consultancy agency and becoming consultants? My first job was actually I worked in a company producing pacemakers. So that was my dream job to combine the best of two worlds. Pacemaker is exactly the kind of combination of medicine and tech. So I started that company as a software engineer. But then after that, I knew that I want to work with software and product development, but I didn't have a clear vision on which product that I want to work on or which company. So then I become a consultant and I started as a consultant for a different company. And I was approached by my co-founder to start a consultancy company. We felt we would like to create a company that we feel are missing with great people and have a startup around it. So that's how Mirado Consulting was started. And my role as a CPO, I started as a software engineer, became a test engineer, product manager, and then had a couple of product manager roles, head of product, and now as a CPO. So what does Mirado Consulting do and what does Wear Labs do? So Mirado Consulting is a mostly software engineer that we work as a consultant in different company. And what Wear Labs do is providing health checks to both company and, and customers. What is your titles and what are your main responsibilities? At Wear Labs, I work as a chief product officer and I'm responsible for all the product developments and all the products that are created. What does a typical workday look like for you? 
there is a lot of meetings in my work. I need to make sure that everybody is on board and that I understand all the things happening. So there's a lot of meeting with marketing, with UX designers, with strategic meeting to understand the vision and the developers. I love the quote, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. So Maral, what do you love about your role? What I love about my work is that it's so diverse. No days actually look alike. And also I get to meet people from so many different disciplines. I work with doctors, developers, marketing people, UX designers, and it is always really nice to understand their way of thinking. And when putting all of these people in the same room, there is a lot of innovation that happens because there is so many different views. And what is the best experience you've had in your role so far? Any examples? So one of the biggest challenge we have at Wear Labs is to try to make people understand their health status. And it's a very complex thing. When you meet a doctor, you can talk to a doctor, but how do you do it with the digital journal when you can communicate with people? So together with the doctor, and all the team, we actually did a lot of research and had a beta product that we launched and got great feedback. And then what is the biggest challenge you've encountered so far and how did you tackle that? So working with all of these different disciplines, it is both very fun and very challenging because even though there is a lot of innovation happening, sometimes it's hard to understand the different views. So it's up to you to try to make sure that you understand the views of everybody and make sure that everybody's heard and you create something that satisfied everybody. What do you wish everybody understood about your role? I think that the biggest misunderstanding about product manager is thinking that it's a project manager and the focus on is building and launching product. And I will say that the role is more to understand the customer needs, gather insight and try to combine the business need and the user needs to hit the targets, both making the users satisfied, but also meeting the business objectives. What is the common myth about your profession or field that you want to disapprove? I will say as a product manager, you become more a project manager. That's something that happened with the industry and it's quite maybe a new role coming in. What do you love about working in a tech industry? It feels like everything is possible. It's never you hear that's technically not possible. So I love that you can build stuff and everything is happening so fast. Things that we didn't know we could do 10 years ago is possible now. Oprah Winfrey said, I quote, think like a queen. A queen is not afraid to fail. Failure is not a stepping stone to greatness. So Maral, what have by far been your biggest achievement in your career? I will say I'm very proud of what we've achieved with Mirado. It's nice having to talk about it and then actually doing something and starting the company and fulfilling your vision. That's one of them. But also me and my friends started a volunteer project when we wanted to give kids from maybe a bit underprivileged home a chance to experience stuff that they couldn't otherwise, like skiing. So we started a project with the school. We had 12 people giving them the opportunity to go on a ski trip, to learn how to ski. And I think that was one of the greatest projects that I've done. Very impressive. And what is the biggest fact that has helped you become successful? Any success habits? I think I'm very organized. I am addicted to my to-do list. Everything is organized and every morning I just go through it and make sure that I have a schedule of what to do. I think that's one of the things. But also I think it's good to have a balance in your work and try to understand what you can't do. You can't do everything. And that is something I think that you have to consider. How do you measure your own performance at work? 
So as a CPO, you have some key performance, obviously the success of a product, if you meet your business objective is one of them. But also I think that how your teams are delivering and how they are feeling, if they're satisfied, if they're happy, that's a good way of measuring your performance. So just seeing that I have a team that are happy, that's a measure that I have succeeded in my work. With success comes failure. What is your biggest failure in your career and what did you learn from it? I had obviously a couple of failure, but one of the thing is since I'm a consultant, a lot of times I come to a company where maybe things are not working the best way. So I've been involved in a lot of reorg and I will say that one time we did this huge reorg and it didn't go the way we want it. And the learning from that was we tried to do it by ourselves, and that was one of the mistakes with it and realized that you need to bring help from outside. Sometimes you need to realize that some things, some other people are better and do not underestimate people's internal motivation and goals. What makes sense to you doesn't have to make sense for another person. So even though this reorg makes everything more effective, it doesn't mean that for the specific person that is the case. You need to have that in consideration. What is inspiring and motivating you the most in your role and career right now? I really like the field that I'm in. Obviously, I read a lot about health checks and health in general and how to stay healthy longer. So it's very inspiring. And also working with great people, being able to solve interesting problems, create a product that motivates me. Let us now jump into the influence of mentors, role models, champions, and sponsors. Role models can consciously or subconsciously be a powerful force in our lives. In addition, champions can stand up and advocate for us and open up the world of possibilities. Sponsors match emerging talent with leaders and influential employees who can help us move ahead in our careers. Morel, do you have a mentor, champion, or a sponsor today? I don't have it right now. I had it before when I was younger, but not a specific one right now. Who is your female, non-binary or transgender role model you look up to in your field? I think there are several product people that I look up to, but there is no specific one. History shows that it has been more common for men having mentors, champions and sponsors in business today than women. How important do you think is to have a mentor, champion or sponsor during one's career? a very important key to success because as you say before this is most important when you don't know all the path that exists so having a mentor that can guide you and shed light on the path you're going on i think it's very important let's move on to leadership adena friedman president and ceo of nasdaq said i quote Empowering those around you to be heard and valued makes a difference between a leader who simply instructs and one who inspires. And then Shirley Sandberg, ex-CEO of Facebook, said, I quote, Leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that the impact lasts in your absence. So, Morale, what does leadership mean to you? Leadership is actually to be able to guide people and to make sure that people are on board on the vision and people have a purpose and people know what to expect from you. Being able to help and guide people to become their better self or achieve their goals. What do you consider a good versus a bad leader? It depends on the person. I think different people appreciate different things. So a good leader could be a bad leader for one person and vice versa. In general, a good leader is open to listen and see how a person wants to be led or how a person wants to get advice or feedback. Also, I think a good leader creates a safe environment for everybody. So people are not afraid to make mistakes. How would you describe yourself as a leader? 
Yeah, I think I'm very straight. I'm very transparent. To let people have all the information is the key of their success. So I'm trying to make sure everybody has all the information they need to do a good job. As I said before, that it's important for people to feel that they have a purpose and that people feel appreciated. So I try to have those qualities. And as a leader, what values are the most important to you? I like a leader to be honest. And I think empathy is very important. And I think it's important to be able to motivate people. What leadership lessons have you learned that have formed you into the leader you are today? I learned that it's easy to learn from bad leader because I had good leaders that I didn't reflect on because everything was going very well. And it was not until I had a bad leader, I understood what I kind of appreciated with the one I didn't. I don't appreciate somebody maybe micromanaging me. So I usually don't micromanage people. So I will say that I aspire by not doing as bad leadership. What are your three strengths and three weaknesses? I'm very adaptable. I'm organized. I think I'm good at seeing the big picture. The worst is I'm a time optimist. I hate to say that, but I'm usually late. I'm impatient. I want things to move faster. And sometimes I procrastinate. Let us now jump into the hottest topic in business today. Workplace culture, unlocking the power, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Maral, what does DEIB mean to you personally? So I think that diversity is trying to include everybody from all different aspects of it. And being a girl from Iran, moved to Sweden, studied electrical engineer, it was, I think, 10 girls and 150 guys. So being alone in a room make me want to move this field and try to be able to change this a lot. What do you consider being three to five signs of good company culture if you were to join a company? I like when a company have a flat organization. I don't like when it's a lot of hierarchy and a lot of middle managers. And I like that the diversity is in, as I say, in all aspects, not only we want a lot of women, but because I think diversity is also, it is gender, but it's also in culture, in nationality, in interest, in hobby, age, and et cetera. Just because a management group is 50 girls, 50 men, but all coming from the same area doesn't make that a diverse group. So I think a lot of time people focus on gender, but it's much more than that. As a woman, what has been the most significant barrier in your career and how have you overcome these challenges? I think being a woman in tech been challenging for me because I've been afraid of not being successful. Uh, When you are the only girl in the room, you represent your gender. So I always feel bad not doing great because then I'm failing the entire gender. So I think to overcome my fear, to be able to fail and not feeling that I'm failing the entire, you know, my race, my gender, my heritage, that's been one of the biggest things that I had to overcome. What do you think is important for more women, non-binary and transgenders to join the tech industry today? I think not having a mix of group is not good. I mean, having a mix, that's when company can be innovative. So not including certain people, we are missing opportunity of great things. But also my feeling, like being alone is not a good feeling, which makes less people maybe want to join. So I think to have diversity creates more diversity. Do you and how do you speak with your colleagues about DEIB challenges, for example, salary gaps and promotions? As a manager, I'm involved in salary negotiation. And what I've noticed is that usually guys ask for the salary for the work they haven't done yet, but then the girls are asking for a salary that they deserve. So I try to push everybody to stand up for themselves and get what they deserve. I think that's important to see beyond and try to figure out what is it that not only the person 
and that can speak for themselves to get the highest raise, but be aware of what people have accomplished and try to motivate them and push them to ask for what they are worth. There are many public and internal discussion about the barriers women, non-binary and transgenders face from reaching high position in the tech industry. How do you feel has affected it is affecting you and what is your advice on how to best unblock these roadblocks? So I think to knowledge or information, it's very important to work on it and not hope for it to happen. It's important that you have people around you that challenges you and that you don't feel like you're alone. If you have people that believe in you and push you and challenge you, I think that's how you can climb up. And as you said, men have more sponsorship. That's what we need. We need to be able to help each other out, to push each other, to create, to climb and cross all these barriers. Well said. Today, tech companies spend a lot of marketing money to track women, non-binary and transgenders. However, at the same time, they're finding it hard to retain them. Articles show that women are leaving the tech industry. What is your best advice on strategies for how companies can work to build a stronger corporate culture that engages gender diversity and equity? To be able to keep people, this needs to be in your culture. This is not something that you can create after. I see that, for example, a lot of companies are celebrating 8th of March and or making a lot of marketing, but it's not the output that matters. It's not what you do, it's the outcome. It's not that you are celebrating 8th of March that is important. It's to make sure that the woman in your company has a clear career path. It's making sure that the men you hire are on board, that you have good processes for everything. A lot of companies maybe are on the surface. They are trying their best, but it's not getting to the core of the problem. And that's why they are not succeeding. What would you say are the few challenges of implementing the AIB culture in a workplace today? I think it's not identifying the core problem or the issues. So what is the issues? What is it that we need to implement to keep our people? As I said, it could be that the way we communicate is the way we are managing the teams, the way we are hiring, the way we're setting the salary. We need to deep dive in the organization and see where we are failing and try to solve those problems. Why and how do you think companies would benefit from having not just women, non-binary and transgender leaders, but actually higher gender representation at sea level and boardrooms with mandate? Having more women would make it easier for other women to join. And it's very important to have right people at the right place and be at the C level. I was in a company where if you look at the salary, it was all the same. But then if you look at the hiring, it was a lot of middle managers that were women, but at the C level, they were all men. You need to address them. It's not that just because you have a lot of women in the middle manager, it's solving the problem. We need to make sure that we get women higher up. How much do you think the tech industry has changed regarding this subject since you joined? I think it's been changing a lot. We are lowering the threshold of girls entering tech. I love all these initiatives that are coming with girls coding. And I think that creates some kind of safe space to learn. I know from myself, when I was starting to learn how to code, it was very intimidated to be in a room with a lot of people who had much more experience than me. So then it was hard to learn because everybody was so much ahead of you. It's changed a lot. We're going in the positive direction. I think the important part is to keep on pushing for this and not just advertising and just making an effort to keep people, girls in tech. And looking back on your career, what one thing would you have changed in your working environment to break the bias? As a human, you are biased. You would like to work with people that are similar to you. You are judging people even though you don't think you are. So if you have a team that are everybody similar, then it's higher probability for more people to join that are 
similar to that team. It's good that early on, think about this and try to have different people coming in so that you create more diversity. So that's probably one thing that I will change to start thinking of it much more earlier. And looking forward, what will you do as a leader to improve the bias for the next generation of women, non-binary and transgenders in tech? doing a neutral hires, not knowing if this is a guy or a woman to make sure that's one thing that could improve to just remove all the bias. But also I think we need to know about if I'm interviewing two people, as I said with this salary negotiation before, I know that sometimes people have not put things in their CV that actually make sense and some other people exaggerate their knowledge. So so it's important for you to dig on deeper to understand and look past all of the obvious things. Let us move on to another hot topic in business today, which is work-life balance and mental health. Maral, you had without a doubt a busy lifestyle. How do you take care of yourself to maintain good mental health? There is a lot of work and kids involved, so it's not that many free times. But me and my husband, we've decided that we have one day a week that it's only me day. So that's very important to just have one day that I decide what I want to do. I try to do different things, go out with friends, work out, just take time to take care of myself. That time is very important to actually take care of yourself and let everything go. Have you ever experienced burnout? I haven't. I had a mentor very early on that was affected by this, that we had gone through and burned it out. And she told me really early on, be aware of the signs. Try to be organized or not take your work from home. She gave me a lot of tools that I think helped me not to burn out. So whenever I feel like I'm all stressed, I try to use those tools to not get burned out. What is your advice on how companies can create a more mentally healthy workplace in the new now? I think to acknowledge that there is a life outside work and to let people be a bit flexible is important. And also acknowledging that we are not machines. We can't work from eight to five, especially when you have these kind of work, when you need to be innovative, then it's hard to have that mentality that you need to work from eight to five, for example. So I think that company needs to encourage you to take your time off. It's good to have a safe environment that if you need to go and pick up kids, you feel safe, that nobody's judging you and to let people have this work balance. What motivates you every day to get out of bed? I love my job and also my kids wake me up every day. So they are a huge motivation, but I really enjoy my work and I know that no day is alike. So I know it's always something new happening. I know that it's a new challenge. Now, let us wrap up with a few words of wisdom and a piece of advice for our listeners. Maral, what is the best piece of advice you've been given that has helped you during setbacks in your role and career? The best advice is don't see the setback as setback, see them as opportunity to learn. So I try to figure out how can I take this experience and make it better next time. And then what is the worst advice you've ever been given and how did you tackle it? When I was younger, I had a manager who said that if you want to be a good manager, then you can't show emotions or you need to have a work you and private you. And I think that probably is the worst advice that I've got because I think as a manager, it's very important for you to show feelings. You need to show that you get sad, you get angry, you get happy, and that's what makes you human. And also, it's very difficult to to not be the same person at work and at home. I think it would take a lot of energy to try to be two different people. So I try to do the exact opposite. Is there something you wish you would have known or a skill you wish you had when starting out in the tech industry? So when I started KTH, I didn't know anything about computers. I didn't even have my own computer. So I think that I stressed about that 
And I wish that I have taken more time to actually try to learn and not stress about not knowing yet. If you had the ability to go back in time to when you were just at the beginning of your career, what advice would you give to your younger self? I would give the advice that do not stress over which university to go to or which program to choose from, because obviously if you want to be a doctor, then you need to study to be a doctor. But I work with so many people that has similar jobs and coming from so many different university or education. So I think that in the end, you will end up with something that you like. So I would tell myself to not stress so much about the path and it's not going to define who I end up to be. It's just the beginning that you can shape wherever you want to go along the way. And then what advice will you give to young girls, women, non-binary and transgenders who want and trying to break into STEM fields today, especially wanting to become next generation leaders? Good to have a mentorship. Find people that inspires you, ask them for help to come into the industry and learn from them. Last but not least, Moral, what's next for you in your role and career in tech? What are your career aspirations? It's going to sound very boring, but I think that I want to improve the skills and I want to be a better leader, try to learn more about myself and to make sure that I be better at the work I do. Thank you very much, Meryl, for being a guest on the Queens of Tech podcast, sharing his journey with, without a doubt, inspire change and reshape company culture for the next generation of women, non-binary and transgender leaders. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. If you have worked in the tech industry a minimum of three years and would like to share your journey, please nominate yourself or somebody you know to i at jasminemoradi.com. For more podcast episodes and to learn more about the Queens of Tech initiative and to support us, visit queensof.tech.